Hello and welcome to lecture nine of our introduction to machine learning course. Um, we are going to start talking about unsupervised learning in the remaining three lectures. We spent eight lectures talking about supervised learning problems. Just to remind you, supervised learning means that we have some input data and we have some output data that we're trying to predict. So these are always prediction problems. Um, essentially in supervised learning, we're learning the mapping between the input and the output. And this can be regression if we're predicting a continuous variable or classification problems if we're predicting categorical outputs and so on and so forth. Um, in the unsupervised learning, which is our topic from now on, we just have input data, if you want. We do not have output data, we don't have labels, we don't have any values to predict. We just have a data set and we want to do something with it. So we want to, we want to find some structure in it, usually. Um, so unsupervised learning is often connected to data mining and, um, um, and, and similar, um, similar things. So what can, we, what can we hope to find in the input data if we don't have labels to predict? So broadly, at least in this course, we're going to talk about two different, two different aspects, two different applications, parts of unsupervised learning. That's dimensionality reduction and clustering. We're going to start with clustering. That's our topic for today. So what is a clustering problem? Um, here's some toy data, very simple data set with two variables. And, and, and these are the points, are the, the samples. And in the clustering problem, we want to find if there are groups, clusters in this data, right? So here it's quite obvious to, to the human eye that this is a cluster, this is a cluster, this is one cluster or perhaps two clusters. Um, and that's what we want the clustering algorithm um, to tell us, especially if the data are higher dimensional than two dimensions and we cannot just plot it in 2D and look at it so easily. So it turns out that the clustering problem is actually a very, a very difficult, a very complicated problem. And it starts, the, the, the problems start with even formalizing it. So what does it mean to, to cluster the data? What, do, what, what, does, what is the definition of the, of the cluster? Very, very hard to say what captures our human intuition about what the cluster is. I can give different, and, and we will later um, in this, in this uh, video, in this lecture, we will see some examples. Um, even people might disagree, even human observers might disagree about whether this, for example, is one cluster or two clusters, right? And, um, so th th this is hard to formalize. Um, many questions arise, like how many clusters are in the data? Is it, is it, is it three or four in this case? Or perhaps, perhaps it's only one cluster. Perhaps the data are not clustered at all. So you just have one, one blob. Um, and if you, if you put it in some clustering algorithm, it will maybe give you several clusters, but perhaps, perhaps the problem is ill-posed and the data, this particular data set is just not clustered. Um, or if you have two clustering algorithms and they give you some clustering results, how can you compare them? How can you choose the better one? In the prediction setting, you take a test set and you apply two models on a test set and you see what performs better, right? It's very, it's very easy to, to, in principle at least, to say which prediction is better. Here, you have two clusterings. So how do you decide which one is better? So there's a lot and a lot of these conceptual problems, people sometimes say that in clustering is, is not a science but an art, um, and there's some truth to it. Um, we definitely don't have time to cover all of that or even discuss all of that in this lecture today, but we will, uh, we will talk about two clustering algorithms. Um, this is just should serve as a caveat for you to, to know that these, um, this is, a comp if you apply this in practice, there are a lot of problems like that that you have to, to, to think about. But in this lecture, we're going to discuss two particular clustering algorithms. Uh, one is k-means and another is Gaussian mixture models. So we'll start with k-means. In a k-means clustering, so this, this loss function that I'm going to define now, that serves to, to formalize this notion of clustering, right? So we want now to, um, to, to put it into math. What does it mean to, to cluster? And that's just one particular way of doing that. Okay, so we have some input data, xi. We want to split it into k clusters, and that's something important from the beginning. So in k-means clustering, we're choosing k from the beginning. So we're clustering a data set, a given data set, into four clusters or into 10 clusters, right? This is uh, the question of how to choose uh, 
the number of clusters, that's a question that we're actually not going to, to be discussing today. Let's say you know that you want to split it into four clusters. How do you do it? So we, we are going to, in the k-means clustering, we're going to represent each cluster by its average, by the mean, by, by some vector uh, that I call mu here, that will, that will, in some sense, represent the cluster. And the loss function of k-means is just, it, it's very simple. It's just a squared error in some, in some sense. So it's the sum over all, um, over all clusters um, from one to, to capital K. And then the second sum is overall examples, overall samples that belong to this cluster. And what I'm summing is the squared uh, distance from my sample to this representative uh, vector mu. Okay, so this is what we want to minimize. So we want, what, do we, what are the parameters here? The mu's are the parameters. The splitting into clusters, so this S, um, K sets, right? These are just the sets of indices. The set of, in, the set of samples that goes to cluster one, the set of samples that goes to cluster two, and so on. So this S and mu's is, is something that we can adjust in order to minimize this loss. Okay, there's another way to, to write the same loss where we just sum uh, the second sum is over the entire um, is the entire data set, and I'm introducing here this R I K variables that will be equal to one if the sample I belongs to cluster K and zero otherwise. So it's the same thing, just written slightly differently. Okay. Um, yes, illustration. So here is here is how it may look for a simple two-dimensional again data set with three clusters. So these points here are my, my sample points. This in the middle is, is the mu. So this is mu2, mu1, and, and mu3. And these are the lengths, lengths right, that enter the, the loss function. So I'm taking the sum over all these edges of the squared length um, of each edge. And then I'm summing everything that belongs to this cluster and everything that belongs to this cluster and to this cluster. OK, and it's, it is rather intuitive that um, if you like assign this point, for example, to this cluster, then your loss function will increase, right? You will perform worse because you will replace this short distance with this long distance. Or if you move this, this mean uh, point mu somewhere to the different location, all these lengths will increase. Okay, so the loss function makes sense. Good. How do we minimize it? So here's the same loss again. So the, the first piece of bad news is that it is not analytically solvable. There's, there's no way for the um, arbitrary data set to, to have a formula for what the mu's and the r's or s variables are. Okay. Second piece of bad news is that it is not convex. That's something that is not so easy to see from this formula directly, but you will see this later on. Um, it's non-convex and it's badly non-convex. So it has a lot of local minima. It can have bad local minima, um, and we have we have to deal with it. Um, the third piece of bad news is that gradient descent can be used to minimize that, but it actually is a little messy to to write down the derivative, especially derivatives. Um, it, it's it's not. Um, you have to deal with some constraints here if you operate on this. R variables here with this S, it's not even clear how to take a derivative of that. So it's, uh, it can be a little messy. Um, the good news is that there is an alternative approach that actually is very simple, very intuitive, and works well. Um, and it's for k-means, it's called Lloyd's algorithm. So let me explain what the Lloyd's algorithm does here. It's iteratively optimizes over R and over mu. So this means that we first optimize over mu, so we find optimal mu's having the r's, so this means having the, the split into clusters fixed, we optimize the position of the mu uh, vectors, and then we hold the mu vectors fixed, and we optimize the, the splitting of points into clusters. And we keep repeating these two steps until it converges. So let's discuss both steps separately. And it, it, it turns out, as you will see now, that each of the steps is very, very easy, actually. So the first step is, for example, we're holding the mu's now fixed. So what does that mean? We want to find in which cluster should each point go. If you think about that, each 
sample will contribute to the loss function the square distance to the cluster uh, representative vector, right? So if the representative vectors, the mu's are all fixed and you have your sample, where should it go? Well, it should go to the closest mu. That will, this will minimize its contribution to the loss. So you just assign each point to the nearest cluster center. That's all. It's very simple. Um, so here is how you can write that uh, mathematically, that for each point you assign it. So each sample i goes into cluster k, where the k is the, is the value that minimizes this. So it's just the, the closest mu to xi. Okay. The second step would be now we having the we having the sets fixed. So we're saying all these points belong to cluster one, and all those points belong to cluster two. How can we choose the mu vectors to minimize the loss? And that is also very simple and directly given here. So if you look at this uh, this sum, if these are fixed, then basically the sum decomposes into sum for each cluster uh, that you can optimize separately, and then you take the sum that. Is that relates to cluster one, for example, and you want to choose the mu that minimizes that, but this is just minimizing the, the squared error loss. It's basically um, like the estimation of a Gaussian. The, the best, uh, the maximum likely estimate is just to take the mean, um, the, the average of the samples as, uh, as, as the mu vector. So that's a very simple regression problem or Gaussian um, estimation problem. And you can directly see from here that if you want to minimize uh, this one sum for one cluster, then you just take the average. It also, I think, is very intuitive if you remember the, um, the sketch on the previous slide. Okay, so we have these two steps that each of them is super simple. Here we assign each point to the nearest cluster. Here we, um, we choose the mean um, of each cluster as the average of all points that are currently assigned to it. And then we alternate. So it's actually so simple that it may even be surprising the first time you encounter it that this works at all. Like this seems, it seems even, like this seems so simple. It's almost dumb. So let's see how it works, because it does work. I, I, I find this remarkable. So here's the illustration in a very simple case where you have a two-dimensional data. So this is taken from, from this textbook. Um, you have two-dimensional data, and we will just we will just go over the iterations and see what happens. We have to start somewhere. So this is actually one uh, one aspect that I didn't mention. You have to start somewhere. And in this case, I think we just start randomly. So we choose two, uh, two mu. So we choose the uh, mu1 and mu2. And they're just randomly chosen within the, um, within the range of the data. OK, so now, first step, we assign all points uh, to the closest cross, right? So these become red points. These become blue points. Now we do the second step. We put the, cross, the crosses, we move them to the average of the all points of the same color, right? So the red cross moves here and the blue cross moves here. Okay, great. Now we reassign all the points so that each point gets to the closest cross. And now we move the crosses again. And now we reassign the points again. Then we move them again. Um, and again, and you see that it almost doesn't move anymore. And actually, after this point, I can stop because this converged now. So if I now keep, keep iterating, nothing will change anymore. Now every point is already assigned to the closest cross. And the cross is in the middle, uh, is in the average position of all the blue points. So you can keep iterating if you want, but nothing changes. So you can stop the Lloyd's algorithm when it converges. And it's actually pretty easy to see that it will always, it will always converge um, to some minimum, to, to, to a local minimum in this case. Um, and that is because there is just a finite number of, um, of the ways how you can split these points into two classes. And it's easy to see that each step of the Lloyd's algorithm decreases or leaves unchanged the loss function. So the, the loss will never go up during the iteration. So it has to go down or stay constant. And there are a finite number of ways you can reassign points. So at some point, you will just you will just hit uh, you will converge. You can, however, converge to a bad local minimum. So you converge to a local minimum, but it doesn't have to be the best possible solution. And this is something I want to illustrate here. Um, this strongly depends on the number of clusters. 
So if you do this in 2D and you have two clusters, like on the previous slide, it will, I think it will more or less always converge to the, to the good solution. But if you have something like that, so in this case you have a lot of clusters, right? And notice that the clusters are actually very simple here. So there's not really, there's not really this conceptual question of what is a cluster doesn't really arise here because these data are uh, sampled from a bunch of identical spherical Gaussians just located in different places here, um, right? The, the, I think the number of points per Gaussian is the same here. So it should be like the easiest possible data set for, for clustering in a way, right? You have a bunch of identical spherical Gaussians, with the same number of points uh, per cluster. And then you start k-means and this will be an example um, solution that it will converge to depending on the initialization. And you see clearly that it is, not, uh, it is not very good. And what happens in particular is that you have areas like that where one cluster, well, one actual Gaussian is one underlying cluster, is, gets split into several, three here in this case, or two in this case. And there are other examples like this one where two Gaussians are actually assigned to one cluster. And this is a minimum. So if you, if you iterate Lloyd's algorithm, nothing changes because there's no, no like local simple change. There's no point that you can reassign to the neighboring cluster so that the loss decreases. You can decrease the loss, but you need to do a, a drastic change. You need to say, I split this cluster in two and I merge these two clusters together at the same time and then, um, and then the loss will decrease, but um, this, the Lloyd's algorithm will not, will not achieve that, right? So you have to think of, a, of the loss function of this, uh, of this problem having, having a, lot of, a lot of local minima. So if you are in this local minimum, you can do gradient descent or you can do Lloyd's algorithm and you are already, you are already in the optimum. You need to change it a lot to move it to another local minimum that actually contains a better solution. So there's, w what can we do? There's several um, essentially heuristical ways of how you, can, uh, how you can do better. So you can, there are smart ways to initialize the k-means clustering. Um, something called k-means plus plus, for example, chooses the, these initial points somehow in a, in, a, in a smarter way. This can help. Another thing that can help is that, uh, okay, a very, a very simple thing that can help is that you just run it a number of times, for example, starting with different random initializations, you ran it 10 times and then choose the solution with the lowest, um, with the lowest loss. This can help a little bit too. Um, a smarter thing that can help is that after, after in converged or, or even during the iterations, you check whether you can decrease the loss if you split, if you split some cluster into or merge two, cluster, two neighboring clusters together. So this is the, there, there are several of approaches like that, split and merge um, heuristics. So you iterate the Lloyd's algorithm and then um, you're checking um, perhaps if you, if, you, if you merge this and split that, then your loss may go down and then you do that and then you continue with the Lloyd's um, iterations. Um, All right, so this is the, um, the k-means clustering. So apart from these difficulties of conversion that can be to a large extent uh, addressed with this, with this smarter heuristics that I'm not going to um, explain in detail, um, there are some more, more fundamental drawbacks of k-means. So if, even the global minimum of the k-means loss function may not be the best clustering that you're after. So this is something I want to discuss here. So here's an obvious, um, an obvious example where the data are just very far from, um, from, from being um, like a Gaussian blobs in space, right? For example, you have one blob and then this ring around. So you would maybe say, these are two clusters, just one of them has a funny shape. K-means will, will never be able to find that, right? Because, um, because assigning all these points to one cluster actually is, is um, this will have a high loss um, in, that, in that loss function. The distances um, of all these points to the mean 
uh, of this ring cluster will be large, and k-means will think it's a bad solution. Um, there are, though, situations that may seem less extreme, but k-means will still give you something that you don't expect. So one example is that where the, Ga where the classes even may be perfect Gaussian, but are stretched, right? So they are not like the spherical blobs, but they, they are very elongated blobs. So if they're elongated enough, for example, on this, on this catch, k-means may decide to split them in, in like that. So this will become one cluster, and this will become the second cluster. Um, because this will, this will just minimize the, the, the squared error. If you assign all these points to one cluster, then some of the distances will be really, really large, and this will be sub-optimal as, 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 as far as the k-means is concerned. Here is another example. Here, the, uh, the blobs are spherical, but one is really small and one is large, just the radius, um, the, the, the variance of this Gaussian, if you want. In this case, what can happen, is, or what actually will happen, is that they will split like that. And that's because even if the means are exactly correct, so here's the mean of my cluster one, and here is the mean of my cluster two, so where does this point go? It goes to its closest mean, which in this case may be this one, right? So the part of this cluster will be, or part of this Gaussian will be chopped off and assigned to the wrong one, and that's not the convergence problem, that's just what k-means will do in this case. And here is the fourth example. In this case, they are, these two clusters have the same size. Uh, like geometrically, they have the same size, but the, not, but the sample size is different. So there are few points here, and there are many points here. And what can happen here is that again, k-mean will choose to chop off a part here, because even though these distances are all pretty large, that's the price, it's paying, but then actually these distances here will be, will be a little smaller um, to its mean, and since there's so many points here, um, then it's, it can be, um, the loss can be smaller if you, if you assign some of these points to that other cluster. So you will get problems with k, or you may get problems with k-means if you have very different sample sizes, in, in your clusters, if the, or if the covariances, um, of, like either just the, the variance is, is very different or the covariance is very far from spherical. And all of that can be addressed if, we're using, if, we, if we were to use a model of the cluster that is more complicated than what k-means implicitly assumes, and this brings us to the Gaussian mixture models, right? So all three examples on the previous slide uh, were examples where the data within each cluster uh, were a Gaussian. And if that is, if you're happy to assume Gaussian data, then the, it's, it's, much, it's often better to use a Gaussian mixture model that just explicitly assumes that your points, your samples, come from a mixture distribution, a mixture of several Gaussians. So you have a Gaussian here, and you have a Gaussian here, a third Gaussian here, and the, the distribution that is a mixture of them, um, which has this, this density, is just a sum, um, well, a weighted uh, sum of, of several Gaussians. So these are the weights, and these are the means of the Gaussians, the covariance matrices. Um, the weights sum to one, so that the entire thing sums to one as the probability d density function should, right? So, and that is something that we want to fit to our given data set. That's the problem of the Gaussian mixture model fitting. So if you think about that, it's actually, it, it's, it's a little similar to what we did before with the, with the k-means and with the Lloyd's algorithm. So intuitively, one could try to use here an iterative approach similar to Lloyd's algorithms, right? So I'm not deriving it here, I'm just saying, well, one could try something like that. What would it be? We assign each point to the closest Gaussian, not, um, to, not to the closest, in k-means, the closest just meant the closest mu vector, right? The, the mu with the smallest Euclidean distance. Here, it will be a bit more um, complicated because the Gaussians have some shape, the covariance matrix, and they also have these weights, um, pi's, 
So we can, but we can still assign each point to the nearest cluster, like to the best fitting cluster in the sense that this posterior um, um, expression is the, is, the, is the largest. So we just check for every point to which um, of the Gaussians it is um, most likely have come and put, put it there. And then, so that's one step. And then the next step, we update the parameters of, of each Gaussian based on the points there. So one could try something like that, and it will probably work. But let's see what happens if we actually try to derive, um, derive the, uh, the how to optimize the likelihood of this model. Because this is now a nice probabilistic model, right? This is the probability. Um, if we have a sample, then we have the, the complete probability under our, depending on these parameters um, of, our, um, of our data set to observe the data set given the parameters, right? So we can, we can use the maximum likelihood principle that we want to find the, the parameters that, um, that, that, that give us the data set with the highest likelihood. Um, so let's see what happens if we, actually, if we actually go through this math here. I will directly write the log likelihood and not the likelihood itself, right? So this is the sum and the log. Uh, this is the sum of all the, all the samples. This is the logarithm because this is the log likelihood. Um, and within is just this, this, the same thing here, right? So, um, which is another sum over components, over, uh, over this mixture components. Okay, and just to remind you the, that the, the Gaussian, uh, multivariate Gaussian uh, has this exponent in it in the density function. So just to, to see what happens, let's try to set the derivative with respect to one of the, one of the moves to zero um, because we want to find the, the maximum of that, right? So we just take the derivatives and, and set them to zero and see what happens. Um, so let, let's, let's do this. We're taking the derivative of this thing so we have the sum, it, it stays the sum, then we have the log of, of, of this sum, so this goes the, in the, so it's a chain rule, what I'm doing here, so the sum goes in the denominator, because I'm, that's the derivative of the logarithm. Then I have the sum, but only one, one um, term in the sum depends on mu k, so only this one term survives the derivative, and it goes here in the numerator, and then I have to take the derivative of this thing inside the exponent, right? And I have the sigma k, the inverse of sigma k, it goes here, um, and this x minus mu um, is over here, and then we're done, and this should be equal to zero if we are at the, um, at the maximum. And notice that this thing here is just constant in the sense that it does not, it's, it's the same um, when you sum over i, this thing is always the same, so I can take it out of the sum and, um, and, and um, cancel out. And I'm left with, let's rewrite it here, and I'm left with this uh, red term and um, x minus mu, and that should be equal to zero. Um, so let's call this thing um, zik, and let's, let's uh, look at that for a second and try to understand the meaning um, of this zik term. Um, it's, and it should remind you of the Bayes formula, and it, good, uh, it is good if it does. If you, have, um, if you take one sample i, so if you, if you fix one sample i here, then this expression, the zik, Let's say you fix the i and the k, then the zik will tell you what is the uh, posterior probability of your sample i to belong to cluster k, right? Because this in the numerator is the probability that it, that it, that it comes from, from cluster k, and this in the bottom is the sum overall, um, overall possible clusters. So if you divide one by another, you get this zik that will actually, if you sum over k, will sum to one, as it should, with posterior probability. And um, yeah, as I said, for each i, for each k, it just tells you what's the probability that a sample i came from, from the cluster k. Um, remember what we're doing here. We're trying to solve for mu, 
right? So this is now a very simple expression that we can immediately solve. And this is just the, the weighted mean of all points. So you, you have the sum of the entire data set, but the points that have high probability of, having come from, of coming from cluster K will contribute more than the points that have very low probability of coming from cluster K. So you take the average of the entire data set, but with weights um, that, are, uh, that are given by the probability that these points belong to this cluster K. Okay? So this, this makes a lot of sense if you think about that. You, you have some points uh, assigned to this cluster, some with high probability, some with very low probability, those are far away, and then you just take the average of essentially the points that have high probability, and this gives you the, the optimal mu. Um, however, this brushes a very important thing under the carpet, sort of, if I write it like that, because this might seem as I solved it, here's my solution, but of course I didn't solve anything because I have the z, z, z terms in here, and the z depends on this, on this, and this depends on mu and on sigma and on everything else, right? So this is, this should be true if I am at the maximum, but these guys over here depend on mu too. So this is not a formula that I can use to just write down, um, write down analytical solution, unfortunately. Um, I can follow very similar steps, uh, taking the derivative with respect to sigma is just a bit more cumbersome, um, or difficult to derive, but if one does that, then one gets that the uh, sigma should be the weighted covariance matrix. And the, the, if you do the same with respect to pi's, then you get this formula for pi's that this is just the um, basically weighted fraction of points that belong to each, to each cluster. So I think these formulas for mu, sigma, and, and, and pi make a lot of sense. But as I said, they are not really giving you an analytical solution. So what can, one, what can one do? We have the mu, the optimal mu defined through the, the zs that are given through the mu again. But at this point, we can finally do something very similar to what we did in the, in the Lloyd's algorithm. We can optimize them iteratively. And in this case, it's called expectation maximization algorithm. On one step, which is called the E step, so the expectation step, we compute this probability Zik for each point to be in each Gaussian component given the parameters mu, sigma, pi, fixed. So this expectation step just means um, you're computing these red terms that I had on the previous slide, okay? Uh, that's the entire step, so simple, okay? And then in the M step, you now update all parameters of each Gaussian to using the formulas that we derived, these weighted averages and the weighted covariance and so on. Um, and then after you updated them, you go back to reassign the points by computing these new posterior probabilities depending, depending on the new parameter values. And then you update the, the, the parameters again and this should remind you very, very strongly of the Lloyd's algorithm that also assigns points, then updates the mu's, assigns point, reassigns points, and then updates the mu's. Here we have more parameters to update because we have to keep track of the covariance and, this, um, and the weights um, of, of each Gaussian component. And another, com so one difference is that we have more parameters, and the second difference is that we don't just hard assign each point to one of the clusters, but we're computing this probability that for each point that it belongs to each of the clusters. It can be, probability can be very high for one of the clusters and very, very low for others, um, but it will not be exactly zero for any of them. Um, so it turns out that expectation maximization is a very generic algorithm that can be used for many different, pr and is used uh, in machine learning and in statistics for many problems where you're optimizing um, a likelihood uh, of a probabilistic model that has some latent variables. So in this case, the latent variables are the true class membership. So each point actually belongs to one of the, uh, or we can think that each point uh, in our data set uh, 
belongs to one of the, like really came from one of the components of the mixture, but we don't know which component it really came from. So this is latent variables that we cannot observe. But we can use this, this approach where we estimate the probability over latent variables, and then we update the parameters of the model having the latent variables fixed, and then we estimate the posterior again, and then we update the parameters again, and one can, in a very general setting, um, derive and prove that if you do this in a latent variable model, then your likelihood will never go uh, down. It will always increase. Um, and again, you can run, and you, there, there can be local minima, um, but at least you will, you will always, you're guaranteed to reach, to converge uh, towards one of the, one of the maxima uh, of the likelihood. We will, I will mention another example of the, of the latent variable model in the next lecture that, that can also be uh, optimized using EM. So it's a, it's a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful approach. Okay, illustration. I'm taking the same data from the same textbook, and now instead of clustering with k-means, I'm clustering with Gaussian mixture models. Again, we need to initialize with something. So in here, this shows two Gaussians. So this is the mu1, and this is the mu2, and the sigmas are initialized uh, spherically, and the pi's are probably initialized half um, as, as 0 0.5 weight here and 0 0.5 weight here. And now we assign all points um, to these components, and here you immediately see one of the, um, like the second different thing from, from, from the k-means is that the points don't just have two colors, right? They, are, um, they, have, they have some posterior probability to belong to cluster to this or to that cluster. So for some points here in the middle, it may be close to 50-50, and they will be of intermediate color. Um, so you get this spectrum of colors here. Okay, so once you did that, you can compute the weighted mean, which is essentially the mean of the red point, the, the more red, the redder points here, right? But you compute the weighted mean, and you compute the weighted covariance, and you get these two Gaussians uh, after, the, after the first step. So now you hold the parameters of these Gaussians fixed and reassign the, um, reassign the points. Not much changed here to step two. Um, if you skip several steps, then actually one Gaussian will start to cover this region and another Gaussian will start to cover this region. But this is already step five, so actually um, this usually happens slower than, than, in, than in k-means. We need more iterations, but if you keep iterating, then after um, 20 iterations, for example, you have this split um, that, that, that makes sense, right? You recovered the two the two components here. And notice that the final Gaussians um, have different, not only the means, but also the covariance is different. So this is like a bit more vertically oriented. This is a little bit more horizontally oriented. Um, this will, so the Lloyd's algorithm will just converge in the sense that it will stop, you will, you will reach an iteration after which nothing will change anymore. So this is not the case here. You can all, th this, this will converge um, in a sense that it will become stable and the difference, the, like the updates from iteration to iteration will become very small, um, but uh, it not necessarily or usually it will not like entirely converge, right? It's like gradient descent. You will just approach the minimum um, closer and closer. Okay, um, there's one is one tricky point that I also brushed under the carpet until, until now when discussing the GMMs, the Gaussian mixture models. And that is, so let's consider the, the Gaussian mixture equation again, and let's consider a very simple case where we actually just have one-dimensional data, um, right? So these, are these, these points are my data points here, that's one dimension, and here on, on the y-axis I have the, actually the density function. So, and, and let's say I want to cluster it in two components, and it so happens on, on one of the steps that all these points are assigned to, to one of the components, or basically one component looks like that, and another component looks like, like this, very high Gaussian, so that this point is very likely to come from that component, and all these points are more likely to come from the other one. 
And then you keep iterating, and what will happen is that this Gaussian will shrink more and more and more and more around this one point and basically become completely localized and diverge essentially to the delta function on this. And why does this happen? This happens because then the likelihood of this one point will become super high, right? The likelihood of this point will diverge to infinity if the likelihood is just this, this value. So if this becomes narrow and narrow and narrow and higher and higher and higher, then the likelihood will diverge to infinity. And when you compute the, um, the, the summed log likelihood or the, the entire likelihood of the data set, it will also diverge. So it turns out that there is actually a way to make the likelihood go to infinity. And we're trying to maximize the likelihood. So that should be like the best um, solution as far as the, um, as the likelihood function is um, concerned. And, but that is, of course, not the solution we want. It's trivial. It can always happen if you make one of the components uh, variances go to zero. OK, so this may become a problem if you actually implementing a Gaussian mixture model algorithm and you're, you're doing the iterations and one of the Gaussians basically becomes localized around one point and then you get in this regime that it just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and your likelihood explodes. So one has to, in practice, um, it can happen that one of the Gaussians collapses, um, so to say, and one has to, to, to do something about this to prevent this degenerate solution to happen. So for example, if you see that one Gaussian the, the standard deviation of one of the Gaussians becomes super small. You basically kill this Gauss and randomly reassign it in some other part of the um, part of the data set and, and then keep iterating. It's, um, it's like an edge case that a good implementation should take care of. And also shows, but more like philosophically, it shows that there is some problem with using this um, with using loss function, this loss function in the first place. So in practice, we can prevent this from happening and get away with it from it. But I think conceptually, it means there's something, um, something um, about this this loss that's that's not great because it allows these degenerate solutions. This can be prevented if you if you have some, some prior, like a hyper prior, on the parameters and say that the, the sigma cannot is not allowed to to become very small. Like in a fully Bayesian setting, you can put priors on sigma and the mu, um, and this may, uh, may, may address that. But in, um, in this setting, as I explained it, actually, this model um, can diverge. OK, um, some comments on the expectation maximization versus the gradient descent. So we did. Uh, EM here for the for the Gaussian mixture. In principle, it's possible. I said it's cumbersome for k-means, but one can do it. One can do um, gradient descent for k-means or Gaussian mixture model. They are both iterative algorithms, right? They can both converge. So they they both converge to a local minimum in a sense that they are guaranteed to bring you to a local minimum. The likelihood will not. Um, increase, but the minimum can be local and, and um, you, you, you are not guaranteed to, to reach the global minimum. Um, actually, with the gradient descent, you are not guaranteed that your likelihood will, that your loss will not, um, that it will not increase, right? It's possible that you make a too large step and your loss goes up or the likelihood goes down. In EM, this will never happen. So EM comes with a guarantee that after each expectation, maximization, iteration, your uh, likelihood increases or stays the same. So that's actually an advantage. It's good. And in fact, it doesn't need a learning rate. There's no learning rate in the EM algorithm. So you don't need to think about how to choose the learning rate or how to change the learning rate if you get stuck and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's also that's a good thing. Another good thing about EM is that you don't need to impose constraints on the parameters. So for example, all the pi's should sum to 1. So if you do gradient descent, you somehow need to ensure that all pi's always sum to 1. And the, all, all covariances should be positive uh, definite matrices. 
So you do a gradient descent step, and maybe one of the covariance matrix becomes non-positive, definite, right? So what do you do? You need to somehow fix that, or the pi's don't sum to one, so you need to make them sum to one. Um, it's possible to, to, to do all of that, but you need to take care of that. In expectation maximization, these problems don't arise. On each step, you get meaningful covariance matrices because your covariance is just the, covari is the, the weighted covariance matrix of, of, of your points, right? It will, by construction, it will always be positive definite. Your pi's um, will, by construction, sum to one, and um, all, yeah, so all parameters and also the zik, everything will be meaningful on each step of the EM. So this can be actually, um, this is a nice property. One thing um, that I still wanted to say on the previous slide is that GMM, so the Gaussian mixture model, can also converge to a bad local minimum. If you start the Gaussian mixture model on that example that I had before with a lot of different Gaussians in 2D, it can converge to, to a suboptimal solution, similarly to k-means. So all these heuristics that I briefly mentioned, um, split and merge um, of, of, of clusters or smart initialization, smarter than just random, this all applies also um, to Gaussian mixture models. And in fact, GMM typically converges slower than k-means. So what is often done is that you run k-means first, you get the k-mean solution, and then you initialize Gaussian mixture model with the, um, the k-means solution. This can help in, in, in practice too. So let's revisit again what is, what is the difference between k-means and, and Gaussian mixture models. Similar to what we discussed in the lecture on discriminant analysis, one can constrain the covariances in the Gaussian mixture model in different ways. So you can constrain them such that the covariance of each cluster has to be the same. So that's what linear discriminant analysis does, right? Remember in the classification setting, here we have unsupervised setting, we don't have labels, but still we can, we can say our covariance matrix in let's say two, I'm fitting two clusters and I am fitting this, I don't fit two covariance matrix, one here and, and, and one here and then they can be like that. No, I'm saying they have to be the same. So they have to also turn the same. You can, it's relatively easy to um, update the formula uh, for this weighted covariance matrix such that you um, only have one covariance matrix covering all clusters. This is not always a good idea, but it can be a good idea in some cases. Or you can constrain it differently. You can constrain it to be diagonal. You say maybe you have a lot of variables, a lot of features, so if you have a lot of features, then you have quadratic, uh, quadratically large number of parameters in the covariance matrix, right? So it's a lot of things to fit. So maybe one can say, well, forget about the off-diagonal terms, the correlations, I will just fit the diagonal covariance. We can even constrain it to be spherical. So the same, all the same choices and all the same considerations that applied for LDA apply here. Apart from in LDA, we can at least hope to cross-validate or to have a test set and then choose the, the best working model, here you have to go with intuition or with some heuristics of what is a good clustering result um, to choose between these things. But in practice, if you have many features and your sample size is not, is not big enough, then it's, it's often helpful to, to choose a simpler parameterization than, than the full covariance matrix. Um, okay, so a special case would be if we take spherical covariance matrix, so just sigma, some sigma squared times identity matrix, which is shared across all clusters, right? So we say all clusters have the same covariance and this covariance is spherical. And this actually then becomes very, very similar to the k-means. The main difference is that the k-means perform something that I earlier called hard cluster assignment on the E step of the Lloyd's algorithm. Each point gets to the, um, to the cluster that's closest, uh, that the point is the closest to, and, and that's it. So it just gets here and, uh, and belongs, is said to belong to this cluster. So that's the hard assignment. In the, 
uh, mixture model update in the E step, we compute these posteriors, and if the point is very close, um, it will get a high posterior probability to belong to this cluster, but all other probabilities for all other clusters will still be non-zero, so this can be called soft cluster assignment. But the, if, if the covariance is spherical and shared, then this notion of what Gaussian is the closest, that's the same as the, I'm just looking at the distance to the, um, to the, to the, to the mean, right? Because if you think about the, the, the Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian function, if you plug this in there, then the covariance, there's no covariance anymore and everything just depends on your Euclidean distance um, from your point to the respective mu. So this becomes very close to the k-means with this one difference, hard clustering, hard cluster assignment on the E-step versus soft cluster assignment in the E-step. So in some sense, Lloyd's algorithm, and you can, you can, if you now put sigma to zero, then, so if you don't fit sigma, but say sigma is really, really small, then actually the soft assignment will converge to the hard assignment. So you can, um, you can see Lloyd's algorithm as the limiting case of expectation maximization for Gaussian mixture model if you impose the constraint that the covariance is spherical and shared and the variances uh, go to zero. Um, yes, I already mentioned that it may be convenient to initialize uh, Gaussian mixture model with a k-mean solution. And just to get back um, on this last slide to, to this picture from before, so these, these three examples were the cases where k-means would not give you the, the clustering that you expect, maybe, if you, um, if you look at this picture. And these three examples are the cases where Gaussian mixture model will actually work, will be more appropriate and will work correctly in the sense that it will get you um, these two components here and these two components correctly here and also these two components here. Of course, if you use, in this case, if you use the non-spherical um, non full um, covariance matrices, right? So you can think that these cases are solved by, the, by going to the Gaussian mixture model. These cases, though, won't be, right? So this is clearly a non-Gaussian shape. Um, so if you have, if you have complicated non-Gaussian shapes that you still want to call one cluster, just one cluster with a funny shape, um, then the Gaussian mixture model will not help you. And then there is actually a, a, a huge literature um, on, how, on the alternative and completely different, uh, partially non-probabilistic um, density-based and so on, ways of clustering uh, data where the Gaussian mixture model assumptions do not apply. But this has to remain for another course. Thank you.